Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Annie Elise and this is 10 to Life, where we talk all things true crime. We talk about current cases, old cases, new cases, conspiracy cases, short cases, long cases, red flag cases, cold cases. I don't know if I said that already, but we talk about everything here. So if you are checking out the channel, you've never been here before, you've never seen one of my videos, and you like it and appreciate the coverage today, then please make sure to subscribe by hitting that subscribe button so that you will be notified when I post other case videos in the future. And for all of my returning 10 to lifers, welcome back. As always, thank you for joining today, and I am so happy to have you here. <sighs> Guys guys I don't even know I usually I give an intro right here I like feel like I don't even know how to give an intro to this case it is cold-blooded cruel calculated it's full of deceit it's truthfully barbaric and there are just so many twists and one twist at the end that's like a gut punch that nobody saw coming that it is unbelievable it really truly is unbelievable so you're going to be with me for a while today. I hope you're ready. I hope you are hoping for a long video because this is the one. Get your fuzzy socks on, get your comfy clothes, get your coffee, get your drink, get your red flag ready to wave it proudly because, oh my God, there is no shortage of red flags in this case. So without further ado, guys, we are going to jump right in. Tend to life with Annie Elise starts right now. Taylor Parker is a 29-year-old woman from Texas and she has two children. She has a daughter and a son and her son being the youngest. Both of her children have different fathers and Taylor was looking for stability and for a family to love and call her own. Her relationship with her son's father, Tommy, however, didn't work out and the two of them ended up divorcing. Shortly after that relationship ended, Taylor met and married a man named Hunter. However, that relationship was reportedly also a roller coaster, and it ended in divorce in April 2019. Literally weeks after the divorce, Taylor was thinking, you know, third time's a charm when she met this man named Wade Griffin. Wade was a country man, and in true fashion, they met at a rodeo. The relationship took off, and it moved very quickly. And very early into their relationship, Taylor actually confided in Wade that she was pregnant, but that she unfortunately had lost the baby. So the loss brought the two of them closer, and that Taylor really leaned on Wade for support. But as the relationship progressed, and Wade began learning things about Taylor, and who she really is, Taylor started sharing some details about her life that would make anybody raise an eyebrow. Or in my case, I guess, like, raise a huge eyebrow and may and never come down. I don't know. So Taylor told Wade that she was actually inheriting millions of dollars, all in oil and gas royalties. She went on to say that her mom, Shauna, who she also referred to as fake Shauna, had put a hit out on her. So she told Wade how scared she was, and him, being the nice guy that he is, allowed her to move into his home for safety. But this quickly escalated when Taylor told him that this Shauna or fake Shauna or whatever was hacking into their phones and that the Mexican mafia was now involved, which led to a shootout with the FBI. Guys, I wish I had my red flag here, like wave, wave, wave. Taylor said, though, that this was all kept under wraps, which was why there was no media on it. So outlandish, yes. Insane, probably. Possible? I don't know, maybe, who's to say? Now at the time, Wade worked for a hog business where they bought hogs from people and then killed and used the hogs to make money. I don't know the inner workings, guys, and I'm not even gonna pretend to know because I don't. But pretty quickly, Taylor started convincing Wade to use that money to buy more things. So he bought a side-by-side, -side, a truck, and even cows. But he didn't just outright buy them. He took loans out on all of these things with the promise of being paid back from Taylor's millions of dollars in these oil and gas royalties. Now, Wade's family were initially completely taken by Taylor. They thought that she was sweet and just a great woman for Wade to be with. However, they quickly began seeing red flags about Taylor and the outlandish stories that she was starting to tell. And one of the first and the biggest red flags about Taylor was that she didn't have custody of her two kids. Why? 
what happened to where the mother doesn't have custody when more often than not, we all know the court sides with the mother. So surely it had to be something serious. And it only got worse from there. Taylor also told the family about the royalties that she was set to inherit from her grandfather's oil business, but she said that she was having difficulty getting the money. Sounds a lot like Tinder Swindler, right? If you saw that, and if you didn't, you should. Now, another big red flag was that in many ways, Wade's family noticed that Taylor seemed to be more into Wade than he was into her. Taylor wanted to move fast, and she wanted to be close, but his family didn't see Wade in love with her, at least not the same way that she was in love with him, and it was a bit worrisome for them. In the meantime, Taylor got Wade super excited about a property called Pecan Point, Wade had more heart eyes about this property than ever, and this property lies right alongside the Red River in McCurtain County, which is right over the Oklahoma border. It was listed at $4.7 million and is a phenomenal hunting property. Taylor reached out to the agent, Rusty Lowe, about buying the property, and she told him that she was the heir to the Blackburn Syrup Fortune and therefore definitely could afford the property. But I'm a little confused because wasn't it gas and oil, now syrup, like pancake syrup? In any event, Taylor placed an offer for $3.5 million, and the deal was made that Taylor would pay $200,000 up front as an earnest deposit payment, which is a very standard practice when purchasing property. So at Christmas, Taylor and Wade told the family about this property, and they made this big announcement. They got everybody a card with pecans stuck to it to drop this news. Taylor explained that none of them would ever have to worry about finding a hunting lease again. And that was just so exciting for all of them because they are avid duck hunters. So Taylor was the hero and all of those red flags that they perhaps saw earlier were now in the rear view mirror. And in my opinion, probably for selfish reasons, but mm, that's just my opinion. What appeared to be an absolute dream come true for Taylor, Wade, and even Wade's family soon began to unravel. And over time, things went awry with this land deal. First off, when signing the contract for the property, Taylor signed her name as Taylor Parker Griffin. Griffin, as in Wade Griffin. But she and Wade weren't married. So it was interesting that she hyphenated her name like that, especially on papers that were such a big deal and legal documents. But that's just the very beginning of this mega facade that buying this property turned out to be. Initially, Taylor was supposed to have a $7 million wire transfer coming in for her Blackburn inheritance, that syrup cash money, whatever. She was supposed to use that money to verify the funds that she could qualify for this property purchase. But that wire never came in. So she said that she would just use money from her oil and gas leases. But that money also never came in. Big shocker, right? So even with this glaring problem, apparently by this point, she had her heart set on two other properties as well, and the properties in total added up to almost $20 million, but she still had not verified having the funds to afford it. So she told the agent Rusty that she also had an Uncle Butch, (laughs) Uncle Butch, who would give her the money for the properties and, you know, don't worry about it. He's got the money. It's fine if the wires didn't come in. I'm good. We're set. So Rusty was obviously becoming a bit suspicious, and he had his team continue looking into this to try to get it all sorted out. Typically, when people are going after such high-priced properties, they have their finances in order and are ready to close the deal. As this was happening behind the scenes, Wade was frequently calling Rusty for status updates, leading Rusty to believe that Taylor was actually not keeping Wade in the loop at all, in the slightest. He had no idea that these wire transfers were not coming in. And by this point, Taylor had written two separate checks worth $150,000 each. But after writing them and handing them over, she quickly asked for them right back. So obviously things were starting to get pretty concerning at this point. These properties were a lot of money, and Rusty was not and could not get this deal done without the finances to make it happen. Taylor finally provided him with oil and gas lease paperwork, so Rusty had a landman in Tyler, Texas go over all of it. But it didn't take long for the landman to realize that they were falsified documents. Not only that, but Rusty was given paperwork that allegedly was from Shell Western Global. The paperwork was a claim to verify the existence of wire fund transfers, totaling to nearly $370 million. But the email attached to the document was an AOL email for a lady named Shelley Links. 
Now, for such a professional company, having an AOL email absolutely made no sense. And when Rusty decided to email this Shelly Lynx person, Taylor became extremely unpleasant. He then tried to reach out to Taylor's rich Uncle Butch, and that's when things began to get very heated. She sent Rusty a text saying, After talking to my dad and attorney, whom have bought land for more than this, it was stated to me that the seller can ask, but you don't have to ask to verify what we have in the bank. Wade and myself both weren't okay with that request. My Uncle Butch is a multi-million dollar landowner, and he says he has asked and been denied. After that, Rusty got a follow-up email from the Shelly Lynx AOL email stating, banking information is completely confidential. The buyers were not under the assumption a verification letter was required until you requested it in your office. I am sending this verification form since I will be providing the funds. Funds and where they come from is not of importance as long as the seller is paid from my understanding. The clients are not okay with the seller calling their bank and are firm on their decision in that matter. I'm sorry, but hi, like if you're buying a multi-million dollar property, yeah, they're probably going to call the bank to verify that the funds are there and that you're good for it. They're probably not going to just take your AOL email and be like, oh, okay, she is the heiress to the syrup company and the gas and the oil at 29 years old. She does have all this money in the bank, a uh, fat chance. So it was a bit passive aggressive, but these emails made Rusty feel like the deal was at least moving forward and that these were just people who wanted hyper discretion. But all of that came to a halt in April of 2020 when Taylor contacted Rusty and told him that the deal was dead, which meant he had no chance of getting that $1.15 million in commission. And Taylor told him that her mom had actually lied about everything. There was no oil and gas lease, there was no syrup royalty, and there was no Uncle Butch. Taylor claimed that all of these people, including Shelly Lynx, were apparently made up by her mother. Now rewind a couple of months to December 2019, during everything starting to fall apart with these properties, Taylor announced that she and Wade were expecting a child and that she was pregnant, and the family and Wade were all very excited. But things continued to be suspicious with Taylor when Taylor bought Wade's mom, Connie, her dream car. Connie loved this gray Nissan Altima Platinum. She had looked for this car for a long time prior without any luck. Then, Taylor bought her the car and was once again the hero. But just a few weeks later, Taylor called Wade and told him to have Connie come drop the car off in the driveway. She told him that the car had a recall on it and that the dealership would be picking it up. This did not sit right with Wade's mom, Connie, but she hesitantly drove it over, but not before telling her husband that they would never see the car again. Her husband told her that she didn't know that for sure, which she replied, yeah, I do know it. I do know it. Dealerships don't just pick up vehicles on recall. It didn't make any sense. So a couple weeks went by and she hadn't heard anything about the car, so she went ahead and called the dealership. The dealership informed her that there was no recall on the car, but instead that the car had never been paid for. And as this lie was unraveling, Taylor had also been promising Wade's dad a new barn to replace the one that he lost in a fire. But obviously that was not going to happen because clearly Taylor didn't have any of the money for any of these things. Everything was falling apart. So then in March of 2020, Taylor publicly announced her pregnancy on social media, just as the world began shutting down due to the pandemic. She proudly shared that she was due on September 22nd, 2020, and apparently she wasn't wasting any more time on those minor money issues anymore since she now had to start planning for this baby. But there was one major red flag for Angela Pate, who was related to Wade by marriage. Angela and Taylor had apparently gotten close, and Taylor often vented to her about her relationship issues with Wade and how she was worried that Wade would leave her. In addition to that, apparently Taylor had confided in Angela that she had a prior hysterectomy. Taylor told Angela that before telling Wade that she was pregnant, she should take another pregnancy test to really confirm this is true. Taylor assured her that she was pregnant and told her that this pregnancy was intended by God. Taylor was excited. She was showing all of her family and friends her sonogram pictures, her test results, everything relating to the baby. If it was related to the baby, she was sharing it, even urine test results like TMI overkill, but she was excited and she was proud. And in April of 2020, Taylor sent a pregnancy confirmation to Angela saying, you know, here's the confirmation from my nurse. I am pregnant. I know you were worried, but there's nothing to worry about. 
but there was just one problem that Angela noticed with the letter. The name of the nurse who signed the letter had the same name as the patient of the letter that it was confirming to be pregnant. So basically, the letter said that the nurse was pregnant, not Taylor. So when Angela told Taylor about that, she got very defensive and upset and told her that there was a mole that her mother had hired at the clinic and that they must have done that, which Angela knew that she had to play this smart. She already had her doubts about Taylor, and this was just really sealing them for her. Previously, when Taylor told everybody about the alleged hit that her mom had on her, she started hanging out at Angela's house a lot. But then she actually ended up telling Angela that her mother actually took her own life, but that she didn't want to tell her grandparents. And eventually, her mother was seen at a Christmas party, which massively confused everyone who had thought she was dead. Taylor is just like a walking red flag, story after story after story. So right as this pregnancy stuff was all going down in April of 2020, Angela received an email from a person named Mandy Body, who was allegedly actually Taylor's mother. And the email said, listen, you don't know nothing about Taylor. Don't try to be a mother figure to her. I did an amazing job making her look bad. It took time and accurately planning my every step of the way. She brought you to the bank and made herself look like she was lying to get a check cashed. I had already arranged everything. My helper knew she was coming with you because she called making sure. You wasted your time on her because that check was never good. Let her fail in life. Let her see what it's like to have nothing. I've worked it out perfectly. I've arranged this all so there are no cracks, you see. Things won't add up, and she will look even more like a liar. I stole numbers to make her think people were calling and doing things for her, and it was never them. This will not end well for her. No matter where she turns or what she says, there will always be a lie to fall back on her. See, I'm going to send her in such a deep depression, she will probably try to take her life like she has tried before. But if not, then making Wade leave her will do the trick. See, he will have no choice but to leave because nothing will be true. I've made his family turn on them from pretending to be people like a dealership that didn't get paid. Does it click now to you people? Just let her fall into a hole and not get out. She will go crazy thinking she did the right thing for a certain reason, but in reality, I made her think that way. She has a way of wanting to protect everyone. Well, that's what got her into this mess. If you want to be her mom, good luck. She is like the child we should have terminated in the beginning because she was the accident I didn't want. Maybe you will get the big picture and enjoy the mess. She's looking for someone to love her, and when Wade leaves because I've made her out to be a liar, well, she'll come running to you. Just watch. Nice website and Facebook. Maybe you can pop some sense into her because she has none. Okay, guys. The email is long. It's confusing, and it's really questionable. Who would even said that? send that to a stranger or acquaintance at most? And who would ever go to those lengths to ruin somebody? It made no sense. It's almost as though whoever's writing it is trying to justify all of the lies that Taylor has had and, you know, take the blame off of her and put them onto herself saying they orchestrated it. It is so weird. At this point, Angela was also still doubting the pregnancy and she took Taylor to Walgreens and got a bunch of tests. And no real surprise, most of them came back negative. But one was questionable, and it left her pretty indecisive. So Angela and Taylor decided to go to a clinic for a urine test, as that would surely be more accurate. They decided to go to a different clinic, this time called Health Express, because remember, according to Taylor, there was some hired mole at the last clinic to ruin her her results. So Angela obviously wasn't going into the clinic with Taylor because it was prime pandemic time, and you couldn't go in with anybody. So Taylor went in alone. And she says that Taylor came out with a weird look on her face and a paper similar to the first one that did show proof of pregnancy. Taylor had only gone in with her wallet and the paper wasn't folded at all. So that convinced Angela that these results were real and had been freshly printed and that she was indeed pregnant. Wade's mom, Connie, however, was not convinced that she was pregnant and it caused a lot of friction between her and her son. The two of them argued many times over the next several months, and at one point she even considered hiring a PI to follow Taylor around so she could show her son that she didn't think Taylor was being honest. 
Connie and Wade had already had a massive blow-up fight about financial issues after Taylor's ex-husband had contacted her, and that left them not on speaking terms for nearly four months. So that left Connie treading on very thin ice with her son. Despite her feelings and doubts, she did decide to attend Wade and Taylor's gender reveal party because she had gone to her other sons the week prior. She's clearly a supportive mom and didn't want Wade to feel unloved. And it was announced there that they would be having a baby girl. And they decided the baby's name was going to be Clancy Gale. But not long after the gender reveal party, Wade went to Connie telling her about all the stuff Taylor's mom allegedly was doing. He even told her he thought that her mom had set up cameras in the backyard because in an email who he thought was from, you know, her mom, she mentioned sit them sitting on the back porch and drinking coffee that morning. And the emails were coming from a shadow account with the name Mandy Body, that same account that emailed Angela. So Connie was convinced that Taylor was behind all of this. So she loudly said, I don't know who wrote these, but whoever wrote this is pure evil. And she said all of that while looking in Taylor's direction. But that didn't phase Taylor. She was pregnant, was in a loving relationship, and was determined to have her happy ending. Throughout the summer, she continued to be very active on social media, sharing her excitement about her pregnancy and upcoming birth of their daughter, just posting away. She was ordering baby items and even created a baby registry for things for the upcoming baby. But once again, there was a detail that was not matching up. The registry said that her due date was September 28th instead of the 22nd, like she had previously announced. So could it be a typo? Sure, but it would be a weird one for someone who seemed to be so organized. On July 2nd, she posted about medical appointments for the baby, and the way she made it sound was as if she was having some sort of pregnancy issues. However, luckily, things seemed to be okay, and in August, she and Wade and her growing baby belly took maternity photos together. Despite all of this, and despite the photos, despite everything, as this pregnancy continued, people were getting suspicious, and Wade was unable to get any sort of information from the clinic that she was going to because due to COVID, he couldn't attend the appointments that she had, and when he called the clinic, he was unable to get any of the information due to patient privacy laws. So essentially, he was at the mercy of Taylor for updates. This baby wasn't planned, and apparently at this point, he had also made it clear that he wasn't in love with Taylor, and he made it clear that he also was not prepared for this baby. Finally, September arrives, and this was the month that their baby girl was due to arrive, and surely things would get better between them once they were a happy family and they had their new bundle of joy. So as family and friends got more nervous and doubts continued to grow, they were kind of expecting the news to break of a miscarriage. And on September 2nd, Wade even made a Facebook comment acknowledging that people did not believe that Taylor was pregnant. Around September 15th, Tommy, Taylor's ex, sent text messages to Wade over multiple days, telling him about Taylor's previous hysterectomy and told him that she was using sonograms from her previous pregnancy. He also told him that hospitals were on high alert. Tommy sent Taylor the screenshots of his messages to Wade, which angered Taylor. And according to her, Tommy was trying to ruin her life and was just lying. She was pregnant and she was about to give birth and nobody was going to get in the way of that. Taylor was feeling stressed and she needed a friend to lean on. So she reached out to a friend, well, maybe more of like an acquaintance, named Reagan Hancock. Taylor was an amateur photographer and had photographed Reagan and her husband Homer's wedding a year earlier. Reagan and Homer loved her work and Reagan even recommended her business on Facebook. Taylor and Reagan had stayed in contact via Facebook, and Reagan was now pregnant with her second baby. Her first daughter, Kinley, was with her ex, but she and Homer were raising Kinley together and were over the moon about the new addition on the way. They also had already decided on a baby name as well, Little Baby Braxlin. Taylor took a baby gift over to Reagan, and the two of them continued to text back and forth for the next week or so. On September 22nd, Taylor reached out to a man about selling a trailer full of hogs for a little over $6,000. But Taylor didn't seem to know or understand licensing and transport rules for hogs, so the man assumed that it was a scam and said he wasn't interested. On December 27th, she reached back out, telling him that she got everything organized in regards to licensing and the transfer, but he still refused. On September 30th, Taylor went to her scheduled OB appointment, but when she got there, she started hysterically crying, and when employees checked in on her, she told them that she wanted to reschedule as her husband was in the military and had just died and her mother had also canceled on her. 
So, of course, employees were more than willing to reschedule for her, but they did offer her a sonogram to cheer her up. Taylor declined the sonogram and rescheduled for the very next day. It was odd to them because most moms would be absolutely delighted for the sonogram to see their baby, but what was even more odd to these nurses was seeing Taylor sitting on a bench outside the clinic afterwards, sitting for quite some time, all while watching pregnant women coming in and out of the clinic. On October 5th, nearly a week had passed, and still no baby. And, I mean, thank God, because Wade's house caught fire. This fire was an intentional fire, and it knocked out the power and the plumbing. It was later determined that the fire was actually started by a lighter and was technically an act of arson. But at that time, everyone was unsure who would start this fire. So Wade and Taylor went over to Connie's house, Wade's mom's house, to shower. While Wade was showering, Taylor told Connie that she was set to be induced that day, but that it was canceled because a bomb threat had been called into Titus Regional Medical Center. A hundred people actually had to be evacuated, and all inductions and procedures had to be canceled that day. And this was real. But Connie was just over Taylor, so she said, yeah, you called it in. She also showed Taylor a photo she found on Facebook of Taylor's mother with Taylor's kids in Colorado. And she said, I see your mom has the kids and they're having a great time up in Colorado. Just completely over Taylor and her BS stories. And who even knew what the truth really was at this point? Because Taylor was moving forward with this pregnancy, having maternity shoots, doing the registry. I mean, who knew what the truth was and what wasn't? So next it was Taylor's turn to take a shower. And while she was showering, Connie and Wade got into a very big argument. Because Taylor was due a little over two weeks earlier on September 22nd, Wade had taken time off work under FMLA, and Connie told him that she was worried that he could lose his job if it turned out that Taylor wasn't even pregnant and that a baby never came. She told him that he should go back to work and that he would get a call if the baby came. She told him, Wade, she is not pregnant. She had a hysterectomy when Trey was born. He's five years old. She's not pregnant. And Wade did not take that well. And when Taylor got out of the shower, he stormed out of the house. Although he wasn't in love with Taylor anymore, this was his child, and he was furious that his own family was doubting that, doubting his child, doubting his judgment. On October 8th, Taylor went over to her friend Reagan's house in the morning. She sat outside of the house in the morning in the driveway for a bit before driving away. She then returned back to Reagan's, but this time had a baby gift and Starbucks. She and Reagan hung out for a while, and Taylor left around 10 p.m., After she left, Reagan posted on Facebook about their night together, and it seemed like a nice little visit between friends, and the two of them had a great time, bonding over the upcoming baby bliss, as Taylor's new induction date, since the bomb scare, was scheduled for the very next afternoon. So on the morning of October 9th, Taylor sent Wade off with that trailer full of hogs to sell them to the buyer that she had previously talked to. The plan was to head to the hospital for the induction once the sale of the hogs was complete. But remember, that buyer had backed out and didn't want the hogs. So did he have a change of heart? Because Wade had text messages of somebody agreeing to buy them for $6,100. So he showed up at 7.35 a.m. to the buyer's ranch in Oklahoma after driving for almost four hours. At 6.46 a.m., Taylor got $10 worth of gas at the local Easy Mart and stopped at McDonald's. Then, just after 9.30 a.m., Taylor was pulled over in DeKalb, Texas, after an officer saw her driving fast and erratically. While the trooper was behind her, Taylor called 911, saying, I have a state trooper behind me and I need an ambulance because I started having my baby. The dispatcher asked where she was and Taylor said she was trying to get to Idabel, crying, that's where my doctor is, I'm started having my baby, I have to get there. And Idabel is in Oklahoma about 35 minutes from DeKalb, Texas, where Taylor was stopped. When the officer trooper went to her window, he saw a newborn baby in distress and an umbilical cord protruding from Taylor's pants. An off-duty nurse stopped to help with CPR and said that they should cut off her yoga pants. When they were cutting them, the placenta fell out. They helped Taylor change and do some pajama pants that were found in her car since she had to cut the yoga pants off. Taylor had blood on her legs, her hands, her face, shoes, clothes, and feet. Most of the blood was dried, and there was no blood on her driver's seat, which the officer initially thought was strange. Taylor was absolutely hysterical. The main priority at this point was to get them both to a hospital and get them checked out. So he was talking to dispatch as Taylor was screaming in the back, we gotta get to Itabel, that's where my doctor is, I'm not going to St. Michael's. The officer asked her how old the baby was, and Taylor said it was only like maybe 35 minutes old. 
CPR was being performed, and Taylor could be heard saying, come on, Clancy, come on. She was begging for the officer to just put them in his car. She told the trooper that she's being seen by a holistic midwife in Oklahoma, and then the nurse gave her a wet paper towel to wipe her face and her hands. She told them that she was at Walmart in New Boston when she felt pressure and then left and got in the car. She says that she felt that she had that urge to push and then the baby came out while she was driving. She also told them that the baby was due September 30th, which made them very concerned because that would mean that the baby was now late, yet this baby was still very tiny. Before getting in the ambulance and being taken to McCurtain County Hospital, Taylor called Wade and said, I started having her. I couldn't drive. I was trying to push a baby out. The ambulance is here. So as this horror fest was taking place and unfolding, Wade had been at the ranch owner's home for a couple hours and was trying to strike this deal after showing up with 150 hogs. Guys, I can't make this up. Yes, showed up with 150 hogs. And the ranch owner was beyond frustrated since he wasn't expecting him. So Wade showed him the text messages, and one text said, Wade, this is Scott. I will see you both in the morning around 6.30 to 7. Taylor said the check was should be made out to Wade Griffin, totaling to $6,100. I have seven groups of hunters this weekend. I need those hogs tomorrow for sure. I already turned two guys away with hogs. Drive safe. I'll send the address for GPS. Thanks, man. So Scott saw this message and told Wade those weren't from his number, and it quickly started to click when he saw Wade's last name was Griffin as he had also talked to a Taylor Griffin a couple weeks prior. So Scott told Wade, this is not from me. This is a bogus deal. I didn't want him. I didn't order him. I'm not doing this deal. He told his ranch manager to show Wade out and went back to his lodge. But then the ranch hand came back and asked if he would reconsider for a good deal. Scott said he wasn't interested and wouldn't touch them without proper licensing. But Wade was really just trying to get rid of these 150 hogs, and the sun was starting to shine and it was heating up. So Scott and Wade ended up agreeing to $2,500. Wade left with an empty trailer around 9.30, 10 a.m., having absolutely no idea what was happening at home. And no one imagined what would come next. A couple hours earlier, at 7.22 a.m., while Taylor had just left the McDonald's, or, you know, after Taylor had gotten gas and gotten McDonald's, Taylor's friend Reagan got a text from a Google app number She got another text at 7.49, and she responded at 7.52. By 8.30 a.m., Reagan's husband, Homer, received a series of very weird text messages from Reagan's phone. The texts were saying things like, she just wants to be happy and it's just not working. So they continued texting, but Homer was concerned because it didn't sound like Reagan usually sounds. He texted her at 8.33 saying, I love you, but Reagan never responded. At 9.34 a.m., a a neighbor sent Homer a Facebook message that he and Reagan's puppy had escaped the house. So he tried calling Reagan at 9.36, just a couple of minutes later, to see what was going on. The neighbor said that the garage door was up, which was weird because it never was up. And Reagan didn't answer the phone. He tried calling again at 9.58, 10.02, 10.04, 10.06, and 10.20, but she was not answering. So he started calling the people closest to them, but before ultimately leaving work to go check on Reagan and the dog. The neighbor put the little black lab over the fence into Reagan's backyard before heading out to run errands for the morning. At 10.15 a.m., Jessica Brooks, Reagan's mom, arrived at Reagan's house to check on her. When she walked in, she saw her 34-week pregnant daughter laying face down in a pool of blood. She called 911 and said, help me, my daughter's been murdered. And when the dispatcher asked what happened, she said, I don't know, I don't know, somebody. And then it was just unintelligible. Then she said, there's blood everywhere. Oh, my babies. Oh, my God. In the 911 call, Jessica was crying out to her husband, Marcus, yelling, did they hurt her? I can't do this. My baby, my baby, my baby. She then asked if Kinley was all right before saying, I can't tell what happened. Did they just hurt her? What did they do? There's so much blood. There's so much blood. Marcus found Kinley in the other room, and three minutes into the 911 call, Kinley asks, where's mommy? Police quickly arrive and turn Reagan over, unveiling a gruesome discovery that her baby was missing. The house and Reagan were in absolutely shocking condition. Reagan had multiple stab wounds and deep incisions all over her body. She had been cut open from hip to hip, her uterus pulled out and cut. 
Her hands had many defensive wounds, including bruises, scrapes, scab wounds, and cuts on her fingers and palms. One finger was dislocated, and the tip of another was nearly cut off. There was a bloody handprint on the refrigerator right below ultrasound photos. A child's bathing suit, who I assume is Kinley's, was soaked in blood on the living room floor. There was a urine-soaked diaper on top of a pool of blood in the living room next to the couch. There was a large blood stain on the edge of the couch with clumps of what appeared to be Reagan's blonde hair in it, as if her head was leaning against it at some point during this savage attack. A blanket on the living room floor was soaked with blood and what is believed to have been amniotic fluid. Reagan had a circle indentation mark on her forehead that matched the bottom of a four-pound mason jar with a monogrammed H a jar from their wedding that was filled with pink and blue sand. There were bloody swipes by the front door with more patterns suggesting bloody hair was smeared against it. It indicated that Reagan was pushed against the wall, sliding toward the front door and down to the floor. The wall near where Reagan was found was absolutely splattered with blood in all directions. Some of it was even dripping down the walls. Just truly horrific, barbaric, and uncomprehendable. There were also watery bloodstains on the kitchen and hallway bathroom sink, as if somebody had tried to wash something bloody. And while going through all of this discovery, they noticed a white croc shoe that was left inside the house. By this point, Homer had arrived home to the crime scene tape and to Kinley in the driveway. He wasn't allowed in the house and he called his neighbor at 10.35 a.m. This is the same neighbor who found the dog. He told her that his wife was dead and it was a very quick 30 second call because clearly he was in absolute shock and distress. While Reagan's family was in absolute shock about her death and mourning the loss of their daughter, wife, grandchild, baby, you name it, the hospital across town was trying to figure out what the hell happened to Taylor who just gave birth in her car. Taylor was very adamant about not having an exam, but when they did examine her internally for bleeding, they found she didn't have a cervix, and she wasn't bleeding anywhere internally in her private areas as if she had delivered a baby, and an ultrasound showed she had no ultrasound. They also did a blood test and found she had no pregnancy hormones, but she was still insistent that she had delivered that baby girl. And I mean, girl, it's time to give it up at this point. The jig is up. The jig is up. At around 1 p.m., all local police were notified of a murder and kidnapped baby. At 1.22 p.m., the baby that Taylor had claimed was hers was taken off life support and pronounced dead. Doctors said that this little baby would have been viable, but she had suffered a lack of oxygen. Police connected everything at this point, and they went to the hospital and arrested Taylor. She was charged with capital murder for the murder of Reagan. And she was also eventually charged with capital murder and kidnapping for Braxlin. Braxlin Sage was 7 pounds and 18.75 inches long when she was kidnapped and murdered by Taylor Parker. Police are investigating after a woman was found dead in her home after her unborn child was removed from her womb Friday morning. Police in New Boston, which is about 24 miles west of Texarkana, say they responded around 10.20 in the morning. The woman was found dead inside the home. The child also did not survive. Police say they arrested a female suspect in Oklahoma. Right now, details are limited, but the New Boston Police Department and Texas Rangers are investigating. Katie Johnston for CBS 11 News. Reagan's mom, Jess, posted a photo and announced her daughter and granddaughter's death on social media the very next day. Her family also did a media interview a few days later. I'm outside Reagan's home, which is where it all happened last week. And over the weekend, people actually started building a memorial for her with flowers and stuffed animals outside of her house. Never quit smiling, never quit trying and moving on and tackling the next hurdle. The most beautiful person her spirit, her, her personality, everything about her was beautiful. A piece of us is gone now. Emily Simmons says her sister Reagan is the glue that keeps her family together. She always held us close and she's holding us closer now. The 21 year old was known as wife to Homer Hancock and mom to three year old Kenley Grace and she was also expecting another baby girl, who she'd named Braxlyn Sage. She became a mother early, um, but after she had Kenley, she went on to get her high school diploma, and she was aspiring to uh, 
eventually get in she was going to start taking classes again in the spring um, and she wanted to go into nursing eventually. But the community is lifting this family up. She loved unity. She did not she did not like any discord in any relationship. She didn't like confrontations. She wanted unity and this would make her so proud. For now, the family is leaning on their faith. Just prayers. All we can ask for is prayers. Everywhere I look, I see her. Our family says they expect this memorial to just keep growing and there are already fundraisers started in Reagan's honor and you can find more on that on our website on KSLA.com. Reporting in New Boston, I'm Destiny Patterson, KSLA News 12. Taylor's interviews over the next few days were anything but normal. Taylor said that she and Reagan had gotten into an argument and that she shoved Reagan to the ground. And according to Taylor, Reagan was so injured that she asked Taylor to take her because I feel like I'm dying. Take the baby. Taylor said she begged me to take her. She kept saying, get her out of me, get her out of me. And when police asked her how she got that knife, she told them it was from her medical kit that she used on her dogs when she would take them hog hunting. But she said that she set the scalpel down after taking the baby out. However, during the autopsy, the scalpel was found broken inside Reagan's neck. She told the detective, I remember taking the baby out of the sack and she wasn't breathing. The cord was around her neck and I told Reagan that she wasn't breathing. I turned her over and was hitting her on her back and a bunch of fluid came out and Reagan yelled to me, go. As if Taylor was somehow the martyr and the savior to this little baby girl and needed to be the one to get her to safety and that Reagan commanded her to go and you're the one that can save my daughter's life. I can't. Now we don't know. This very well could be true because it but it could have been a different spin on it and instead of the portrayal from Taylor of Reagan begging her to take the baby out of her and then take her when she realizes the baby's not breathing it could be that Reagan was still alive when the baby was removed from her and at that point she wanted her little girl to live and directed her to go with her we don't know Taylor said, I then laid it on the floor and I'm going with what I remember. I don't remember stabbing her and I was the only person there. The detective said, I'm going with you did it. You put that knife in her neck and then you walked away. We recovered the knife, the scalpel, whatever you call it, the blade, it was in her neck. Taylor also said that Reagan was still alive when she left and that she was over there because Reagan was worried about her and was worried about the headaches and blackouts that she had been having. So Reagan had told Taylor to come over and rest. According to Taylor, she had a migraine episode before going over there that led her to wake up in a funeral parking lot. When she got to Reagan's, she said Reagan grabbed her in the driveway. Taylor said she grabbed me in a caring manner, but it was forceful. That's when she scratched me, and it was like I was going in and out, and she kept hollering at me, you need to wake the F up. Taylor said she told Reagan that she needed to get away because something was going on, and that Reagan just would not let her. That's when they started shoving each other, and one thing apparently led to another. So obviously the police didn't believe her, but Reagan's phone was missing, so they couldn't find the text that went back and forth. And to this day, Reagan's phone has not yet been found. But one of the saddest things in all of this is that little Kinley was in the house as this massacre unfolded. Taylor said that Kinley came out in the middle of it and she yelled at her to go back in her room. And it's been said that she was found hiding under a blanket, which I can't imagine the fear that she had when she saw her mom getting murdered and heard this attack taking place. The police also questioned Taylor about the bomb threat that had taken place at the hospital previously. By this point, they had figured out that it was her. She had downloaded a voice-changing app and made herself sound like a man. She wouldn't admit it, though, and the detective told her, you can admit to cutting a woman with a scalpel and taking a baby out, but not a bomb threat? And he followed that up with talking about the connection that she had with the Hancock family, saying, you took her family pictures. You took her three-year-old photos. She trusted you. Taylor pled not guilty and was held on $5 million bail in Bowie County. And her trial just finished, literally a few days ago. It started mid-September and ended Monday, October 3rd. And so much information came to light in the trial. First, that Taylor made up everything. Made up everything about finances, the people in the emails, and pretty much everything else that she has ever said has been a lie. Also, that pregnancy was of course fake, and she had taken elaborate measures to fake it. In August, she was on random websites such as fakeababy.com looking at fake pregnancy bellies and even bought a new one right around the time those maternity pictures came out. And I'm really confused as to how Homer didn't know that this was all fake. 
Because does that mean that they weren't intimate for the entire 10 months that she was pregnant? How did he not ever see the baby bump without clothes on it? And that's not to say he's not a victim, but it just seems strange. And more details about her previous relationship with Hunter came out. Allegedly, Taylor faked seizures and medical problems consistently to try to keep Hunter around. She also had been pushing him to have a baby despite having had a hysterectomy. She told him that he should get a loan so that they could hire a surrogate and that her grandmother would pay for it all in cash. Allegedly, a man by the name of Tim Hightower was supposed to bring the money, and Hunter got many texts from this Tim man, including a picture of a duffel bag full of cash, but pff, Tim never showed up. Taylor told Hunter that Tim had gotten in an accident on the way and the paramedics stole the money, another elaborate lie and story that Taylor concocted. After her divorce from Hunter, things got even crazier. Taylor told her friends that she and Hunter had, in fact, hired a surrogate, but that Hunter cheated on her with the surrogate. And apparently she was so desperate for a baby that right after the divorce, she offered two friends $100,000 to carry a baby for her. Both of them declined, thank God. And honestly, why do you want more kids when you don't even have custody of the two you have? Taylor was pretty emotionless the entire trial, clearly showing no remorse. There was only one time that her eyes looked like she had been crying, and that was right after her attorney called for a recess. The timeline of the murder was spelled out in the trial, and prosecution said that after September 15th of 2020, she began researching things about delivery more than ever. She was Googling things about hospital births, videos of C-sections, among many other weird things. When she was sitting on a bench outside that clinic on September 30th after rescheduling her appointment, she actually was looking up the license plates of pregnant women that she was watching going in and out. Possible plots to follow them home, to see where they lived? Oh, it's disgusting. After she left Reagan's house on the night of the 8th, she ended up going home, and between 3.11 a.m. and 3.30 a.m. on the 9th, she made five calls to McCurtain County Hospital. At 3.45 a.m., she had a brief call from Wade's phone, then Wade's geodata showed he was heading to Oklahoma. Starting around 4.28 a.m., Taylor watched YouTube videos about C-sections and births at 35 weeks, the same duration of pregnancy that Reagan was at. She left her house at 5.36 a.m. Investigators have been able to prove that Reagan died between 7.52 a.m. and 9.14 a.m., which is when both of Taylor's phones and Reagan's phone moved away from the Hancock's home. Other testimony on the prosecution side was from the doctors, from witnesses, from Wade's mom Connie, Wade himself, and a clinic worker from the very first clinic who was actually invited to Taylor's gender reveal, which by the way is just extremely odd. So the clinic worker didn't go to the gender reveal, but was invited. And apparently her hands were tied due to HIPAA, but she apparently knew the whole time that Taylor was not pregnant. So Taylor inviting someone who knew she wasn't pregnant is just so odd and such a ballsy, bold move. I guess because to her, it would make her story somehow more credible having them there. During Wade's testimony, he discussed that he believed Taylor because she showed him documents and emails and she had an explanation for everything. So clearly, he was also a victim of her lies and manipulation, but I'm sorry, I'm not trying to shame you, kind of, you're kind of a dum-dum, like, you could have figured it out, I think. Taylor's team was really trying to get her off the hook. Initially, they tried to get the capital murder charge thrown out. They said that a fetus has not yet been born, so if it's not alive, it can't be kidnapped, which makes no sense because Braxlin was already born when she put her in the car with the umbilical cord in her pants. So the judge denied the motion to drop the charge. They also tried painting a picture of Wade knowing that she actually wasn't even pregnant. They said that he, since he has assisted in hog births, he would know if she were truly pregnant or not. But it was made clear that Taylor was on trial here, not Wade. In the end, her defense team never called even one witness. And to me, that sends a clear message about the type of person Taylor is and the crime that she committed. Not even one single person was willing to vouch for her. Taylor also declined to take the stand as well. During closing statements, the prosecution spent 40 minutes, and Taylor's attorneys spoke for just eight minutes. Within an hour of deliberations, the jury came back with a guilty verdict for capital murder. According to people who were there, Taylor sat emotionless during this verdict reading. She didn't even flinch at the verdict. Sentencing is expected to begin on October 12th, so the jury is going to begin to hear testimony that should help them decide if she deserves the death penalty or not, which I personally believe she does. This was cold calculated and brutal many ways of her whole life until 
until it came to this with, with trying to keep weight. And I think that they did an amazing job how they how they laid the whole thing out start to finish. So you, I wasn't shooting earlier, but you said she's your niece? She is. Your name? Jamie Mason. Jamie Mason. So tell me something about uh, Reagan. She was a mess. <laughs> she was an absolute mess. Um, she loved Kenley. Um, she was so excited for Braxlin. She loved taking pictures and having duck lips. You can see from her little girl from, from Kenley now with the pictures she takes, she's always got some duck lips going on. So, um, but she, she was just a mess. She was a sweetheart. Thank you so much. As for little Kenley, her biological dad passed away in May of this year, and Homer is now raising her. Homer is also in a new relationship, and Reagan's family is very happy for him. Her mom said that he's still in his 20s, and he deserves happiness. Homer never went back to that house, besides once, to collect his things, and he is obviously still grieving this terrible loss. Taylor is obviously a horrible human being, and it truly seems like she just craves attention and will do anything to get all of the attention on her, even going to the length of murder. While searching, I found photos of previous Facebook posts that she made. She was constantly posting about medical issues, almost like she just always needed some sort of sympathy. That doesn't compare to the murder, though, of Reagan and Braxlin, but I think that those slowly started to build up and she got more and more into her own lies, her delusion, and medical problems that she eventually did the unthinkable. I would love to hear your thoughts on this case. Should Taylor be sentenced to death, or should she receive life in prison? And what do you think led up to her committing such a heinous crime? Is it mental health, or is she truly just a sociopath? Let me know in the comment section below. I know this one wasn't easy to hear, guys, and I know it was a long one. I appreciate you sticking with me. Right now, all we are doing is waiting until sentencing. So I personally hope she gets the death penalty. I think that she is a risk to the population. I think she is horrible. I think she is calculated, and I think she is truly evil. So that is what I see as fair. Personally, I think anybody, no matter the crime, if a child is killed and killed so brutally, I think that death penalty should be on the table. That's just my personal opinion. So don't come for me. Don't try and cancel me. That's just my opinion. So let me know what you guys think of this case um, and what you think the motive was. And do you think that um, Wade knew? How do you think he didn't know? Did he never see her naked for 10 months? Like, there's just so many things in this case that weren't making sense and it seems like people saw the red flags and they saw the writing on the wall and perhaps somebody somewhere could have intervened to where it didn't get to this level but at the same time taylor seemed pretty determined and that she was going to go through with this at all costs so i'm interested to hear your thoughts please leave them in the comment section below thanks guys for tuning in please don't forget to like this video on your way out and as always if you want early access to all videos that i post on my youtube you can get early access by joining patreon and that'll also give you access to discord if you want it so take a look at that if you're interested all right guys thanks again and until the next case stay safe bye